we were just talking about cities, and I thought someone was gonna throw in a transition. Oh but... well, I was trying to, but then you were like, "What? You know what's also a great city to film in?" Uh, well, Nashville. Nashville. <laughs> so I I've been to Nashville once in my life. Have you? Really? Yeah, that was, it was when Nate and I went on our grand cross country oh, road trip, road trip yeah. to get Jack the dog from Ohio. And on our way back, we drove through Nashville, and Nashville looked like a good town. But I was only I there for two I just can't imagine minutes. that road trip where you're passing by all these amazing cities, and then you stop. The end point is Cleveland. <laughs> Technically, it was on the way back, Nashville. Could you imagine if the movie we watched was just called Cleveland? Ugh. <laughs> Probably be a lot sadder. All Robert right. Altman epic. Flynn. So, this week, we we finally got Nick on the podcast, and we got him to watch Nashville. So, Nashville's not on the BFI list, just so everyone's no, clear on that. We just picked it because there's not really any new movies to watch. Um, yeah, I feel like this is just going to be the norm Well, from now on. There has been... should just, you guys should just start taking recommendations from listeners. We should. Oh, you know what's funny? This is the time to do it. Yeah, it is. So Nick will rec. No, I don't know. Actually, Nick we'll do a poll. Maybe. This. Yeah. We'll give him some oh, that'd options. That'd be cool. Yeah, come up with like five good options and have them vote. That's There's good. also that's been like independent theaters have been streaming. So that's Ooh. there are technically new movies. I was gonna see if you guys wanted to do like a we just watch all the movies at South by Southwest and talk about it. That would be a yeah a, a South by Southwest that. online episode. That'd, yeah, that'd be good. Mm-hmm. Could do that. We are getting yet again off topic. So we watched Nashville. Anyways, let's talk about a very long, boring movie instead. <laughs> so we watched Nashville this this week. Nashville is a 1975 movie by the director Robert Altman. It is two hours and 41 minutes long. And it is a, a movie that Chandler recommended that we watch. And I just bumped my mic. Yes. Now, here's here's the thing. I recommended this because I found it vaguely similar to Yee Yee. And now that you've seen it, can you see why I think it's vaguely similar? I see what you mean by that. I yes. think there are some critical differences. And as a result, I don't love Nashville as much as I do Yee Yee. I fucking called it Chandler. Chandler and I were talking about this. I told I told Chandler after, right after I watched it, I wa- I texted Chandler talking about it. And he was like, "I'm telling you right now, I I don't think Jacob's going to like this movie." And I'm like, "I don't I think it's 50-50. I think he either hates this movie or loves this movie. And I don't think it's anywhere in between." And I I predicted that you would hate it. It kind of sounds like he just said in between. I very specifically phrased that in that I don't love it as much as he well, you don't uh, love a lot of things as much as Yee Yee. This is true. It. I don't know if you noticed, but I remade my... I did. It's back on the list. My yeah. favorite. It It jumped quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, it's a good movie. But no. So it's it's interesting that Yee Yee is kind of this large epic of a family. And it's just kind of showing you little vignettes of their life. Actually, not even vignettes. Mm-hmm. Vignettes is the wrong word. Little scenes of their life. Little conflicts that are happening. And it ultimately comes yeah. to a point at the end um kind of ties it all back together and nashville i do see the similarities where it is this kind of grand scope narrative following a bunch of people this time completely unrelated for the most part and then eventually they they never really come together they kind of come together at the end but they're in the same place yes (laughs) that's the most they ever come together yeah so do we want to go around and and state our general thoughts on nashville I'll start because I feel like it's going to be a gradual de-escalation from here. But I love this movie. I really, really like this movie. I saw it for the first time like a month and a half ago because of, you know, I'm very interested. I read a lot of um, read and watch a lot of behind the scenes stuff. And a lot of my favorite directors cite Altman as a really big inspiration. And I know one person who especially loves Altman and this movie is Paul Thomas Anderson. As I'm sure, Jacob, you could see the Magnolia connection. Here. I was going to say, if you didn't bring it up, it is. I'll comment on that later. Continue. Uh, I just I really like this movie because it's so unlike anything else, really, where it's 
kind of about everything and there's a lot of characters but you don't really know what's going on with any of them they're all just brought together by this one location and this one time in american culture but every character feels fleshed out without having to go too deep into who they are it's a big fly on the wall movie and i like being the fly on the wall but then other than the location, I feel like they're all kind of brought together by similar goals and aspirations, too, which I mean, I guess we can. I mean, discuss, yeah, but. they are. And, you know, before you, I, you know, you guys get into it, I think that what appeals to me uh, about Nashville as it's depicted in this um, movie is that it's almost like redneck Hollywood. Yeah. That's what it is. Where everybody moves out there with the same goals to be a country star, but they have this sort of feeling of inclusivity that we're all in this together. It's almost like a super, super cynical Bible Belt town where it appears so friendly and nice on the outside, but on the inside, it's just as dirty and uh, just as corrupt as something like Hollywood. Yeah. So, Nick, what are your general thoughts? I'll preface my opinion of this film by uh, kind of breaking down the situation at which I watched it. So it came after a long day of just sitting on my computer for probably like nine hours working on shit. And I was really tired and I checked my letterbox right after and I realized it had been a significant amount of time since I watched a movie and a significant amount of time for us is like seven to 10 days since I had watched a movie and it made me anxious. So I immediately pulled one off the shelf and I knew I had to do it for this podcast. So I put it on. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm excited to relax and just watch a film, not have to think too much. And then I watched possibly the most thematically dense multitude of characters, all with different personalities. There's like five million <laughs> things going, I don't know, kind of going on. I don't know on. a single character's name. Oh, not at all. Not not at all. Yeah. I, I, can just, I can tell you every single character and their point in the film, but I can't tell you a single name. But I think I'm so on the fence about this movie because I I was I was I will admit I mean I was sending you guys Snapchats of of me joking that I was asleep while watching it because it it was slow but I don't think I can say anything about the movie was necessarily bad so I don't I I I don't want to blame me finding it slow on the film and perhaps maybe just my mindset at the time that's kind of why I prefaced. But I, I think the editing is great, and I think the script is is insane. The fact that they got all these characters to work in a narrative, and I mean, it's was previously a television show, apparently. But um, no, it's it wasn't previously a television show. What I meant by that was they when they finished filming, they had so much film, so much footage to work through that they originally started to cut it as a ten hour miniseries before they decided to cut it as a movie. Hmm. Good lord, there was another 8 hours of footage that they there make this s- film. 30 something miles of film. Good good lord. Okay. Yeah. Well, that explains a lot. Um, but I would say if I had to if I had to uh shorten my answer, I would say this film is great. Definitely worth watching. Definitely done well. Um and I won't break it down any further until we go further than that but i guess jacob what are what what did you think i'm interested i'm so interested in hearing what you think i think that's probably why i'm the most excited to do this podcast okay so a little i've talked a little bit about robert altman on the podcast before but i will just reiterate that i am not as big on robert altman as i think a lot of people are i find him same and his I find his films to be just lacking, not like good, but good in a lacking way that I've never felt really satisfied by a experience watching his movies. I'd say that uh, McCabe and Miss Miller is my, by far my favorite of his. Mm-hmm. And I have a very particular uh, hatred of MASH. And then the only other one I've seen is The Player, and that's uh, a solid... I don't like The eh, Player. ...from me. Yeah. So I don't really have much to go off of. Uh, so I will admit that freely, that I this is my fourth Robert Altman film. And I have to say that 
Nashville was surprisingly engaging for me. <laughs> I was not expecting it to grip me the way it did. And I was not expecting to find it all so interesting in the way that I did. And I'll, and I'll preface by saying this isn't necessarily the movie for me. And I am not I think the audience a... that w- likes country music or anything that's going on in this film whatsoever. Mm. And despite that, I like it. I like it quite a bit. I think it's a great movie. And I think it is for the reason that I love I love movies that are very specific time capsules of a place. Oh, yeah specifically in like american history of like this nation that you know there's not a culture there's a culture that kind of forms from this melting pot this weird thing that we have going on here and nashville Mm. is such a incredibly dense movie of the 70s like it's a microcosm of the south of nashville of the 70s of so much. You can learn so much about that time period from watching this movie. And that's what I found personally interesting. I just wrote down the comment, the hair, the clothes, the culture. That's what I like watching it. And like, what were people thinking in the seventies that any of this was okay. And yeah. that's what, what I really mean, it's not me as in. egregious. It's not as egregious as something like the 70 or the eighties, but of all the things, like, the the fashion of the country stars is what I found to be especially <laughs> just weird. Shelly Duvall is, like, 50 pounds in this movie. Shelly Duvall <laughs> looks like a, um, oh, a freeze-dried human being. <laughs> or like Shelly Duvall looks like a human light being. pole. That's it. Shelly Duvall weighs about 45 pounds with the clothes on in this film. Yeah, and I just wanted to tell her to eat the whole time and stop going over uh, after weird men. See, I'll I'll be honest. Okay, this uh, I'm gonna I'm just gonna read the opening paragraph to Roger Ebert's re review, um, because Roger Ebert. Oh, is he back? Know, no, he's he's still dead. I believe he's still dead. Okay, um, but he had. Damn. I don't know if anybody is familiar with Roger Ebert, but he had you know his standard four star rating. And then he had a list of movies called Great Movies, where he would reevaluate them, and if he found them to be even better than he originally thought, it's a great movie. Nashville was re-reviewed in August of 2000 and is considered to be a great movie. And the opening paragraph is taking down Pauline Kael's 1976 collection Reeling to reread her famous review of Nashville. I find a yellow legal sheet marking the page my notes for a class I taught on the film. What is this story about, I wrote. The film may be great because you can't really answer that question. And I do think that that's accurate because the whole thing is just one giant time capsule of American culture and how the American culture affects this specific city. Because I think Nashville is one of the most uniquely American cities in the entire country. Because not only is it a booming music scene, it's a booming music scene of a genre of music that appeals to to only Americans. I think Nashville, if you were ranking American cities as like pure Americanism, it's up there Mm -hmm. with like LA, New York, Chicago as having its own like identity beyond America. Like if someone outside of America. Yeah. Like, Oh, Nashville, Miami, Florida, perhaps. I don't kind of. Uh, So what's interesting about this is I think the reason uh, being is that um, so the the movie was written by a woman named Joan Tewksbury, who is also a director who directed a few things, mainly theater, a few movies before this. She took a trip to Nashville for some theater thing, and she wrote like a diary about her time there. And when she got back to L.A., she thought it was such an odd and interesting city that she went back there for a month and just wrote the entire script based on her experience. So she's like the BBC reporter. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that. Uh, So a lot of what happens in the movie is what happened to her when she flew back to Nashville, there was a giant pile up as she was coming out of the airport and she was stuck there for two hours. Um, She witnessed the insane uh, mayor mayoral um, campaign of some dude who drove around with those speakers. Um, But 
she had written this giant script, something like 170 pages of just her experiences laid out into these little short stories. And Robert Altman found it, gave it to all of his actors when he started making the movie. And then when he started shooting the movie, he told all the actors on day one to throw out the scripts because he was going for a very naturalistic improv report or a, a type of movie. Um, but I've seen original drafts of the scripts and it's hilarious because I don't know if you know in screenwriting, when you have two characters that are talking over each other, you do double columns, you know, just mm-hmm. two right next to each other. There are parts in the script that are five columns. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, and I don't know if you've heard this story about the premiere of um, McCabe and Miss Miller, Jacob, but uh, is it Warren Beatty? He's in that movie, right? Yeah. Is he the, is, yeah. Or, so when Warren Beatty attended Beatty? the premiere of Mc, no, Ned Beatty's in this movie. He's the guy who does Some the, Beatty um, is in the movie. Yeah. Warren Beatty. It's Warren Beatty. When Warren Beatty attended the premiere of McCabe and Miss Miller, he was sitting right next to Robert Altman and he'd only shot the film. He hadn't seen any editing. And you know how McCabe and Miss Miller has a lot of that overlapping dialogue sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, about 20 minutes into the movie, Warren Beatty just turned to Robert Altman and said, is this how the whole movie's going to sound? And Robert Altman went, yes. And Warren Beatty left. <laughs> <laughs> left? So it's strange by today's standards. I can only imagine how crazy this must have been in the 70s. Well, it's interesting watching it today because it is, we do have that historical perspective and distance from the time period that it was mm-hmm. made. And then you have actors like Shelley Duvall. You have Jeff Goldblum in this. Who says nothing. And he just rides say, around his trike. I didn't even realize it was Jeff Goldblum until the end of the film. When I had, only realized you had, it was him because you, you have that it. one shot of him in the audience at the um, rally where it's just so clearly Jeff Goldblum. Mm-hmm. But every other shot yeah. of him in the film, it doesn't look like him at all. Well, he's all. mostly obscured it's by sunglasses I was waiting the whole. I was waiting yeah. the Yeah, I was waiting the whole movie for him to pop up. It's the most Jeff the, Goldblum the, motorcycle too that he that, could oh, that it motorcycle. It definitely oh is, and I love the joke. They like make a joke about Easy Rider too. <laughs> Ever yeah. since Easy Rider, everyone has those stupid bags. And then the the son of the country singer guy, uh, he kind of looked like oh, Jesse his... Plemons to me. I don't know. If yeah, he oh, does. That's what I was saying. I was thinking that too. I was gonna make a joke about it in the group chat. Is if they remade Nashville, they're gonna have to get jesse plemons because it literally is jesse plemons it is they have the same mannerisms they have a similar face it, it was weirding me out <laughs> so um another interesting character in this movie is the bbc reporter mm-hmm. whose name is opal and do you know who she's played by mm-hmm. geraldine chaplin that's charlie familiar. chaplin's daughter oh yeah that's great that. you, you can go back and see but see her character for example is a reason uh, just there's little details about her character that kind of sum up why I love this movie so much. So she is the reporter, the BBC reporter. Um, and she goes around asking people, uh, just interviewing people, has the microphone interviewing, latching onto the famous people and not affiliating herself with the non famous people. And there is a line when she's talking to, again, I don't know her name, the mother of the death children. Do you remember, you know, that character? Yes. The character, yes, who's married to Ned Beatty um, in the movie. Uh, But she introduces herself when she uh, talks to the mother of the deaf children, saying, my name is Opal. I am with the British Broadcasting Company, the BBC. And when she says that, the mother of the deaf children kind of gives her this quizzical look and then continues on talking to her it's because it's the british broadcasting corporation not the company so it's pretty obvious through another a lot of the other little bits that this woman is not really with the bbc she's just kind of using that as a disguise to you know talk to people but it's these tiny little details that you can infer so much about these characters and their lives without being explicitly told and that's why i kind of like this movie because you you're not looking at stories you're hanging around and uh, around in places and sort of eavesdropping it's kind it of is, a tapestry of people's lives of just little mm-hmm. little segments little colors little flashes of who they are and you don't ever really get to know any one of them too well yeah. And that's that is 
I'm surprised this enough. works as well as it does. Yeah, that's what... When I saw this movie for the first time, I was about 30 minutes into it where I just paused and I'm like, okay, I felt like I mess, missed a lot. I looked at the plot synopsis on Wikipedia and they said it has a very unconventional structure. So at that point, I just stopped reading. So I'm like, okay, nothing is really happening, but a lot is going on. If Another example of like that weird character things they do is I found it interesting that they start the movie in that recording session yes. with the douchey old country guy. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. I don't, I don't remember his name at all, but they, either. they, in, they introduce the character as like this complete douchebag. Like he's yelling at the piano guy for making mistakes and he's very particular. And he's like a good old then, country American yeah, boy. Yeah, good old country singer. boy. He's like, what? Yeah. He's like, Hey Phil, what's that? What's that piano's player's name <laughs> over there? He says something about frog. like, he sounds, uh, he says frog. He's like frog. Well, he sounds more like a dog or something. I thought that was funny, <laughs> but then he's an asshole in this scene. Right. Uh -huh. And then that's it. Really? You, you just, for the rest of the movie, you never see him as an asshole. You see him as just like this public persona. There's like well, an implication he's that he's, he's in yeah. public. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's so weird that they, like they, they introduce the idea of him being an asshole and then they just don't do anything with it. It's just kind of the end of it. And it kind of speaks to like this weird, like they don't no, no characters are really resolved. No one, there's no plot. There's nothing pushing the story. It's just, we're just watching all these people's lives and it's, even though I found it boring, I can't really necessarily pin why. And I never necessarily wanted to turn it off or stop watching it, even though I found it boring, which is weird. I could see how someone finds this boring. And I think that's okay. Because you definitely have to be in the mood to be with these people and in this place. And I just want yeah. to quickly go back before I forget to the BBC reporter. Some of my favorite... Oh just kind of random, really random moments in the film are where she's in the the uh, car graveyard and there's just this wide shot that's slowly zooming out as she's like narrating her, her own internal monologue. <laughs> and it's like, this is both like pretentious and kind of <laughs> yeah. just down to earth. And like, this is... It, it that moments like that where I got to spend a little time with the character and just know who they are mm -hmm. were really great. And I think that's what made the film work for me. But yeah, even the, though I didn't moments... know like the connective tissue be between scenes didn't always work for me. I think with the characters, there are moments where the characters do come together. It's not all of them, but it's a good amount of them. And those scenes are typically the best. I think my favorite scene in the movie is when you have that woman who really can't sing who is forced to sing and strip. Mm. It's just so cringe inducing, but it's hard to look away. And I love at the end, she has the one honest person that tells her you can't sing. And she just like flat out denies mm. that person. Um, apparently when they were filming that scene, all those extras, like everyone who wasn't a, a character was just an extra in that part that they hired just for the night. And they didn't tell him anything except, you know, look like you're had a country bar. And um, she starts singing and all the stuff is recorded on set. There's no like, you know, dubbing or whatever or post. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 um, and she sings the song and people they're you know, they're nodding along, faking to it. And apparently there's a bunch of people who came up to Robert Altman after the, they shot that. And they were just like, you're going to dub over that. Right. And Robert Altman just went, no. <laughs> and everyone was just like, all right. <laughs> And it's important to bring up the music because I just want to get it out there. I like country music. I like a good amount of country music. I don't think a lot of these songs are that good. Oh, they're there is over an hour of music in this movie. I did not. I, was about I to didn't say, enjoy any of the songs. I oh my god! That. I that, like that. some of them. Um, the but the important thing to know is that one, all of the songs in this movie were written and performed by the people in the movie. So everyone who sings, they are singing a song that they wrote. Well, that's great. Um, Actually, no the 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 part the song where like the three, um, band members, yeah, when they sing and then when the guy sings his little "I'm Easy" song, I like yes. that. That was a good song. Was it Bill, Tom, and Mary? Is that what it was? Is Something that the like only that. Only character names I, I remember. Know. It's Keith Carradine. Well, no, not Keith. Is Keith Carradine the one in Kill Bill? Something like that. Yeah, that's Is David he... Carradine. Yeah. Ke 
Keith Carradine is in this movie. Um, David Carradine's so, the weird B movie guy, isn't he? Yeah, in Kill yeah. Bill, he's Bill. He's in Kill Bill. I've never seen yeah. Kill Bill. Oh, I have seen Nashville great. though. Yeah, you have seen Nashville. Um, so yeah, the two songs that I really like are the "I'm Easy." It's a good song, and I think it actually won an Oscar for original song, or is at least nominated. Um, and I like the song at the end. Yeah, you, because yeah. I feel like this that ending scene is kind of I know it's the very last scene, but it's that ending scene that really made me go from like to love the movie because I kind of understand understood everything. Um, and it's you know it's funny seeing this in 2020 when we've had so many just shootings like this where you just kind of see oh that's the American mm-hmm. attitude back then too it happens we sing mm-hmm. it off pretend like it didn't I don't know about you but I saw it was about halfway through the film when I noticed when he's talking to his mother the shooter and he won't let her the Shelly Duvall touch the case I'm like well oh, there's a gun in that case he's shooting someone I don't know who's dying. But I knew that, that, like, I, I was. I had the I, I had the opposite reaction. I thought he was just a weirdo with a really nice instrument. Because for me, it, it the what happened? Are we just going to say what happened at the end? Or yeah, spoilers? Spoiler? Is yeah, spo- it's okay. So when he when he shoots the when he shoots the chick at the music festival, that I didn't realize that was happening until like the he shows up at the rally and they show the shot of him in the audience with like a smug face. You're like, okay, he's going to kill somebody. I didn't realize until that point. Hmm. He didn't look right the whole film. Maybe in the first couple scenes he was in, but after that, if you think about it retro, like retroactively looking at the character design, I mean, it's pretty obvious he's going to shoot somebody if you just look at him. But I, I, for some reason I wasn't thinking that way, but, um, so yeah, it's like, I'm you know, the slicked about. down the, hair and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious because I want to know what people thought back then, because now with, you know, our violent history, as soon as I saw that guy, I thought, OK, he's probably going to shoot someone. But I want to know the people in 75 were thinking like, oh, this weirdo. I don't think a lot of because one of the interesting stories I heard about this was Bette Midler attended the premiere of this movie. Um, and she uh, famously hated the ending because she said, you have put my greatest fear onto uh, the screen. I think about this every time I go on stage. So I wonder if it was something that was in the public consciousness as much as it is now. It might have been a bigger shock. Well, but... I think it has more to do with, and this is brought up in the film, it has to do with you know the shooting of JFK and all that. Yeah. So it was very yeah. much not, not like a Sandy Hook kind of thing, not like a school shooting kind of thing. That's a yeah. much more recent development. I think that there was a general feeling of, after a president has been assassinated, just unease at... Well, th- the yeah. culture, the politics of America, which, yeah. you know, the film is very much about the politics of America. But then it's also at the very end, it's about that violence carrying over into the music and the culture. Yeah. And um, it's also important to note that this was shot um, in yeah pre-production also happened during a lot of the Nixon hearings. And it was either the day where they shot this last scene or it was one of the other performance scenes that they shot it on the actual day and time that Nixon resigned. So there's a lot of that cynicism that I think goes to the movie. But I think ultimately the end, it's hopeful. That, oh, most certainly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I like about it is that it's not afraid to show the, the dirtier aspects of this picturesque American town, but it's not portraying it as inherently evil. For me, the ending, it when they start singing the song and yeah. when it's that the girl that's been kind of at the corners of at the fringe of everything throughout the yep. the uh, the episodes of the narrative, mm-hmm. I there was a moment where I was like, oh, I'm feeling something. And then very quickly it went away and I was just like, oh, well, they're going with the optimistic route. And quite frankly, I cannot be optimistic because I'm standing here <laughs> And we're not any better off than they are there. So, yeah, I think it's good to have that hope, though. It is good. I just especially in the 70s where I'm sure I mean, I don't know, comparatively. maybe. Oh, comparatively, they had more to complain about, you know, the USSR, Nixon, everything. It was. Yeah. What a time. It's, you know, with the rest of the more cynical movies of the 70s, I think this one is comparatively hopeful. 
I did really appreciate how the douchey country guy, his kind of final moment in the film is he gets shot in the shoulder and then he has that brief moment where like the dude's trying to get him off the stage to help him and stuff. And instead he's like, they can't do that to us to Nashville. He's like, keep singing. They can't stop. us." So he's more like concerned with Nashville's image than his own personal safety, which I thought was kind of like a cool moment for the character. Um, but yeah, that's really all I have to say about that character. He sings some shitty songs. And I don't. Make fun I of really couldn't tell you the names of any characters. I just know what they are. I know they, they all. They, like. they all have like, like just they all usually go by like one word or something. The like, I know only like one character is Bud or something. I could tell you who their name is. Hal Philip Walker, and he's not a character. He's just the candidate. He's never, he's never meet. He's an idea, and it's very yep. interesting. And I think mm-hmm. the film is kind of in the way that it's it's a kind of out of nowhere candidate who's kind of anti-establishment. In that way, it's kind of prescient about and it, it could take on new meaning looking at it today in yeah. a world where that kind of candidate maybe exists, maybe doesn't exist. Well, I don't it's, know. It's, I, I also think it's funny is that you whenever you hear his voice over those speakers, it's always something stupid. I love that he wants to change the national anthem. I lo- I wrote that down. That was a note. <laughs> he wanted to change the national anthem. He wanted to eradicate the um, lawyers in Congress. <laughs> the ele- he wanted to eradicate the electoral college. Well, some of this stuff I'm like I I'd be on board with, and then other stuff I'm like <laughs> you want to change the national anthem? Could you rearrange your priorities, my dude? Okay, I, I have I a I have a resource of character names from now on, so I can. Well, I mean, technically, people. the movie introduces you to all of them in a weird. I love style. that intro. I was going to reference that. Yeah, I don't I understand funny. how it works at all, but I love it so much. It could have literally been ripped off and just completely used as an advertisement for the soundtrack for the film. But it's somehow it made it into the movie. And I love it. I love it. I love how he's yelling. I love how there's also like someone there's like three different lines of voiceover running at the same time while he's yelling. It's so good. It's great. It's a great intro. And then it the movie starts and you fall asleep. But I mean, at least the movie started. I would say the one thing I have about this movie that I hate is if I could pick anything is I mean, I, and I get why they did it. I just personally don't like it is every time they sing a song, they do the whole goddamn song. So there's <laughs> yeah. like in this movie, there's like 15 full song performances uncut. I think, though. Oh, a God. majority and of them they something is happening while the song is being there's sung. a lot Not of, all of there's them. a lot of or, intercutting or, in the film and i get why they did it because a lot of the songs are also like there's some like pertinent subtext in a lot of the songs like uh barbara jean if you listen to barbara jean songs after the whole moment with her with her husband in the hospital room like a lot of her songs are about like I think she says stuff about like wishing he would leave or wishing I could get out of this, but I can't. And I'm like, Oh, that's really cool. But I love the, I love the scene where you see him sing. I'm easy. Mm -hmm. Just the way that the mother looks at him through all those. I'm just like, Oh, this is nice. That reminded me of, that was the one moment that reminded me of inside Lou and Davis. That's funny. Yeah. The way he's positioned. Oh yeah. 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 Definitely reminded me of that. Uh, And the one where the, the famous singer is just having that breakdown. (laughs) Wait, wait, wait. That wait, one, wait. the one where she just starts rambling. Where she's on the, they're on like oh, the boat. Oh, yeah, she starts going the... on about how her mother and her. Yeah. Went to yeah. <laughs> where she hears sad. about these kids on the radio. I'm just like, this is ha- hard to watch, but in a really good way. Yeah. It was really because well you can acted. see the band. All around. It, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of great actors in this movie. I love Ned Beatty. I love the girl who plays Ned Beatty's wife. Shelley Duvall didn't say anything. I didn't recognize those Ned Beatty for a while. I don't know why I didn't yeah. recognize him. And as soon as I, I like, clicked in my head, now. I'm like, oh. Yeah. Um, I think it's also interesting that this movie actually did really well at the box office. It did. It was, a, it was a pretty big hit. That's actually very surprising. It's really weird. It's not surprising when you consider that in that time, the box office hits were like today, like the movies that A24 is putting yeah. out today were the box office hits. In the 60s yes, this, and 70s. I guess that's true. Yeah, like, The Godfather was, year, was the highest yeah. grossing film of its year. I wish we could go back mm-hmm. to those times, but, you know. Oh, that'd be well, awesome. That, yeah. 
set yeah this is two years before jaws so it's not that surprising i just find it surprising that something this unconventional and strange yeah it did so well. it didn't always the the connectiveness of the scenes and the characters didn't always do it for me and i kind of lost when it when it transitioned between scenes it sometimes dropped me sometimes when the singing it my attention waned a little bit never to the point where i was dissing fully disengaged and like paying attention to something else but that was the i think the one area where the film is built like that specifically obviously but it doesn't necessarily work in all circumstances for every person watching it i agree i agree with this sentiment because one thing i did notice um that i was going to bring up was there's a couple points where like it cuts to a new moment for a character or something where it just doesn't seem like um, chronologically that would make sense. Like there's a part where I don't remember the scene prior to it, but it cuts to the BBC lady at a car graveyard. Mm-hmm. And she's mm-hmm. like talking to herself and stuff. And it's it's a cute little moment, whatever, blah, blah, blah. A couple of scenes pass, like maybe 30 minutes. And then it's her at the bus graveyard doing the same thing. And I'm kind of like, that seems like it would be the same day or like, it seems like if it were a 10 hour long episode that would, or a 10 hour long pilot, that would have been like the same episode or the same kind of moment. But because they're so separated, it kind of took me out of the film. Um, That was the only instance I have of an example, but I think I do remember like another time where that happened too. The structure is very strange. It seems to go wherever it thinks it's going to be the most interesting. I have, again... It's a movie that on all levels, I have no idea what makes it work, but I think exactly. It works really well. I and did I agree. And that the one thing I found very interesting, and I'm not sure what thematic implications it has, is there's a lot of intercutting between different bars and nightclubs where you often are in like the nice posh uh, nightclub, like where the, the woman does her singing and then she's forced to strip tease like you're in that where it's this mm-hmm. this fundraiser for the political campaign and that's intercut with the sequence in the other one where it's the the three band members that are going up on on stage and that happens multiple times in the film where kind of a lower class um bar uh music venue is juxtaposed between the other establishments that the the political candidates are visiting that the stars are visiting and yeah um, i don't know what that means but it was interest i liked that decision to intercut those scenarios well it's also partly to do with the fact that at this time nashville is a much smaller city Mm -hmm. nashville as far i was reading interviews with the screenwriter and she said that basically that in 75 nashville is still like a hub for country music but it was a lot smaller to where you would run into people like two or three times a day. Whereas now Nashville is still just as renowned for its country music, but it's expanded like five or six times to big the city. size it used to be. Yeah. It was, it was a, it was a big city business with a small town um, mentality back then. And now it's just big city both ways. But yeah, it is interesting. A lot of interesting editing choices here. Well, any uh, closing thoughts on the movie Nashville? Um, I think it is definitely worth watching. I think it is definitely good. But before I can have my full thoughts on um, its greatness, I think I need to watch it again. And I think that's really the only fair way to do that. Because there's just way far too dense to um, do that on one watch. I think that's just unfair to the film, and I think the film deserves more from me. So I will definitely give it a rewatch, and I would recommend anyone that hasn't watched it that's listening, please do, because it is definitely thought-provoking. I'm just going to say that if you're interested in American history, in American politics, in music, this is a must-see in terms of a time capsule from the era, and it... You have to be in the mood to watch it. And if you're not, you I'm really not do. sure how much you're going to get out of it. So I I, I can, surprisingly I <laughs> and very happily got more out of it than I thought I was going to. 
and I, you know, Robert Altman, he's a good director. I just, you know, he's just weird. Yeah. <laughs> just a weird he's dude. Just a, weird just a really dude. weird dude. I love it. I love it more with each passing day. I, it went straight to like the very, very bottom of my top 30 list. And I think it's only going to go up from there. It is, it is dense. It is fascinating. It is a miracle of both editing and production. I have, I couldn't explain to you why it works. I can only explain to you why I like it. Great movie. Five out of five. Great movie. 